second Sunday of Advent, a time of preparation for the birth of the Christ child. And we prepare in many different ways, both at our homes and with family, as well as a, as a congregation with all the things that are happening, even virtually right now within our church. And so let us hear the announcements that Karen has to share with us. Hello and welcome to our service today. A few announcements for you. Reverend Lori's Wednesday Reflection is now available on our YouTube channel, and she's shifted to doing some readings from the book of Isaiah. A link to this reflection will be sent out once it has been posted. Zoom coffee time continues on Wednesdays from 11.30 till noon, and Sundays from 11 to 11.30 a.m. The login details can be found in our newsletter. The season of Advent is here, and there are lots of things planned for the season. There is an Advent Bible study on Wednesdays, which starts at 10.30 and finishes at 11.30. And if you'd like to join, please let Reverend Lori know. And with all of our worship being now online, we are looking to create our first ever virtual Christmas pageant. And it'll be a safe and fun way to involve the whole family in the Christmas story. Once the pageant has aired on December 20th, you'll receive a link that you can then share with your family, both near and far. Reverend Laurie is going to be narrating, but we need you all to help bring this to life. Your participation could be done virtually. Please have a look at our newsletter for more details. The Sunday after Christmas will be a favorite hymn Sunday. So what is your favorite hymn and why? We're looking for short clips from those of you who are interested in telling us why you chose the hymn you did. Maybe it was a childhood favorite. Maybe it was something you special that you sang at home while you put up the Christmas tree. Or maybe it was something you sang here at church. Let Reverend Lori know by phone or email if you'd like to submit a hymn for this special Sunday. Videos are due Monday, December 14th. And our chatters, boy, they've been busy. They have planned three main activities that will take place on Saturday, December 12th between 10 a.m. and noon. Number one, our cookbook is now into production. It's called Heritage United's Recipes and Recollections. And you'll be able to pre-order the cookbook online. It contains over 160 recipe favorites. It'll be available for curbside pickup. Number two, our mistletoe market is going virtual. Items are already listed on our church website. Go to heritageunited.ca forward slash virtual hyphen mistletoe hyphen market to check out all the great items for purchase. And we will be holding a live auction also on December 12th. 
starting at 1 p.m. Bidding will happen via Zoom or by phone, and you can find out more details about the auction, how to pay for your purchases, and how to pick up your items in the newsletter. Say cheese. Continue to send us your photos for the newsletter. We love to see what's happening with you. And now I'd like to share with you some photos that have been sent in from our friends. The first photo is of Reverend Dr. Richard Bott, who is the United Church's 43rd moderator. And this was taken when he preached at a joint service in Scarborough much earlier this year. We have another photo of Kayla and Colby and some photos of a recent snowfall. Thank you for all those photos that have come in. Hymn Highlight has been added to our newsletter. In it, Carol D. shares some background and insights about various hymns and composers. Thanks, Carol. Jesus and Me Children's Time also continues. You can catch Lori sharing a story, a craft, or activity on our YouTube channel, Sunday Mornings. Brian is still taking requests for CDs. He's graciously offered to make CDs of the music that we have recorded from Sunday Worship. If you'd like one CD with 20 songs, or two CDs with 40 songs, please reach out to Brian directly. And finally, a reminder that if you're going into the church for whatever reason, you are required to wear a mask, to hand sanitize, and enter your contact details in the logbooks located at the main door entrance and south door. Thanks, and have a great week. In both the Gospel of Matthew and Isaiah, a messenger appears as a sign from God, heralding a new era. In each passage, the words, do not be afraid, appear, offering a clue that the messenger, whether prophet or angel, was referencing something that induced fear in the recipient. A new way of being, together, of relating, and loving takes care courage, eschewing the present order of things so that a new and better day can be born. Emptiness of loneliness. The emptiness of loneliness. The wounds inflicted. The wounds inflicted. The fear of the other. The fear of the other. Let us pray together. Loving God, we thank you for the glimpses we catch of your gift of daring love. Even in the midst of fear, of challenge, of struggle, even when we cannot yet see a better day, when we'll, we will act like the human family we are, ignite the flame of love within us that we might glow with its brilliance from the inside out. i mm -hmm.
Help us face this fear of difference and dare to see what love can do. Amen. Our lists are long, even in this strange mess where we live the, these days. And when we want to do it right, we want to be safe, but we want to be able to enjoy the season. The prophet Isaiah reminded us that there is work to be done. Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. When God comes in, then healing is to be found, but we need to make the way. So we light these candles, and I hope that you have started your own collection of Advent candles at home and are joining me each week as we light another one. We light these candles as a sign of our faith that the God we worship is not far from us, that we can clear the way for that God to come and dwell with us. Today, we light the candle of love. May its light Help us find our way. O come, O come, Emmanuel. And now let us join together as we joyously sing our opening hymn. Lo, how a rose air blooming. Let us sing together. Welcome to our time for the young and the young at heart. Are we all young at heart? I think so, don't you? It's a great time to gather with all my friends here and to find out how their week's been. Mrs. Bonnet and Peepers the Chick and Lily and Danny, Summer Bear. And of course, there's Fair Crow, 
Taz. I got Moose here at the back reminding us of the season with his very great cap on. I love that. And we've got Jim, our love bear, reminding us this as actually is our, our Advent of Love Sunday, a reminder of the love that fills this time together. A love that reaches beyond the walls of this church into your homes. A love that extends beyond your homes into the community. Thanks for reminding me of that, Jim. We've got Sweater Bear, and we've got our Guardian Angel Bear. We've got Suzanne, our baby, a reminder of a baby that's coming. And of course, we've got Chimp, and we've got our fire truck, a reminder of the wonderful work that continues to be done in our city by all the first responders. Thank you. And yes, I've got my buddy, Joe. Joe, it has been a good week. Uh, it has. It's, uh, it's, uh, it is a hectic time of year. You know, there is so much going on and it's a really good time to think about the things that are important to us. What's that? Oh, thank you. Joe said that I'm important to him. I, I appreciate you saying that. I, I think of all of you here and you know what? You all bring me comfort. That's right, you bring me comfort. Yes, I brought you something to see. I'll, I'm gonna show that to you in just a minute. I wanted to say that a little bit more about that comfort. At this time of year, I bet you that a lot of you in your homes, you do baking, don't you? There might be a special recipe for shortbread cookies or, or some kind of special squares, gingerbread man, or I know that Elena had made her gingerbread house just a couple weeks back. And uh, some of these recipes that we, we make are, are memories of family members who have made them in the past. Maybe a grandma's recipe for chocolate fudge or, or, or your mom's recipe for those shortbread cookies that you so desire to have at this time of year. All of these bring you comfort and they remind you of stories, of, of things that were important to you. And as I was thinking of that, I brought with me a little bear. This was my son, Andrews, one of his very, very first bears. It almost makes me teary. Andrew was in the hospital for over 10 days when he was first born. And this little bear was one of two stuffed animals that kept him company all day long. I don't know if he actually knew it was there, but we've kept it all these years because it brought comfort and there's a story attached to it. And that reminded me of the story that we are beginning to share now, the story of a baby to be born in just a few weeks, the story of the baby Jesus. And we're just at the beginning of that story. And so I encourage you to think on that and other stories that come to mind that make you feel that sense of comfort as we draw closer to the story of the baby Jesus. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, ask for a sign from the Lord, your God. Let it be deep as the netherworld or high as the sky. But Ahaz answered, I will not ask. I will not tempt the Lord. Then he said, listen, O house of David, is it not enough for you to weary men? Must you also weary my God? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you this sign. The virgin shall be with child and bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel. And so ends the reading. As I said last week, our worship series this Advent reflects on the power of music that often points humanity to a brighter tomorrow. At this time, when we can't be together to make music, rather than turn away from music and sorrow, I prefer to think of music and my appreciation of its power in healing, change, and reconciliation. Indeed, on this Sunday with love at the center, I can easily say that love and music go hand in hand. I mean, think of all the love songs on the music charts 
and the relationship between songs with love as a topic go way back in music history. Today's anthem is called Love Has Broken Down the Walls. This anthem champions what it means to accept each other's diversity as a global community, and we pray that this continues as time moves on. On a personal note, my favorite verse is the second one with a text, we're accepted as we are. And I can't think of a more true statement for Heritage United. I hope this simple melody gets stuck in your head and that it comes back to you throughout the week. Enjoy. for sharing a reading with us from the book of Isaiah. And now let us hear our gospel lesson, this week from the gospel of Matthew. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means 
God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. God bless this reading from our scriptures this morning. Amen. On this second Sunday of Advent, our focus is on love. We look at two passages that talk of signs of God's presence, God's love, but also God's challenge to us to get this love thing right. Some of us may be skeptical about saying it was a sign from God, but signs were deeply important to ancient peoples. It might be easier for us moderns to think of them as tangible things that are pointing beyond themselves to some greater concept. This is what the people of Isaiah's time were looking for. You see, if you'd picked up a copy of the Jerusalem newspaper in the year 732 BC, the editorial would have been troubling. The Syrian king was threatening everyone in the Middle East that he would overrun anyone who stood in his way. Then, to complicate things, the Judean king was asked to join in a coalition who was advising a preemptive strike against Assyria. It was at this moment that God sent the prophet Isaiah to encourage the king of Judah to not join this coalition. Isaiah uses a sign from God that is a child. Children were often signs in the Hebrew texts. And certainly as we look at this as a symbol, we see the child as the future generation. At this, and this future is Emmanuel, God with us. Last week, we explored the action-packed narrative from a portion of Mark's Gospel. Remember, we heard about John the Baptist, the shouter, the for crying out loud, get it together, people, prophet, the make straight the way what has been crooked, preacher, attributes that are not found among the introverted and the unassuming, but are common among the agitators who God calls upon to speak to the people. The not ready for prime time forerunners of the Messiah. They are to bring the action packed drama to get the attention of the crowd and keep them from getting bored. This week, we turn to the Gospel of Matthew, which would have been written for a Hebrew Bible literate crowd. Matthew is very careful to connect Jesus strongly to Jewish heritage and history. And so in chapter one, Matthew begins with a long genealogy of Jesus' family tree. There is special care taken to mention the exile, Isaiah's time in the midst of that history. Here we see the past struggles of the Jewish people connected to the present, connected to the future. This child is the product of a historical lineup of generations and will be the sign that God is with us into the future trials as well. So I believe the way to the future is cared for is to love like a child. We must love the child, nurture the child, or we use that symbolic meaning. Love the future, nurture the future. And that is done by being courageous enough to love differently, love fully, love in a way that nurtures the future for all of humanity. The documentary that I chose for this week is a powerful story of young people. Talk about a sign. 
This story wakes us up to the thousands of young lives in danger of getting lost in the penal system. The movie at first can be difficult for some of us to hear because of the harsh language and the anger of these girls who are featured and the reality of their violent pasts. Unfortunately, this film is only available to view in its entirety out of the United States. So I was only able to find a few short trailers of it to get an idea of what it was about. I read, however, that as the film progresses, we are able to see the root of their anger, which is the longing for love and acceptance from a society that, well, has abandoned them. In some ways, it reminds me that Jesus is seemingly illegitimate birth and humble beginnings could have been squashed, could have squashed his message forever. What do we miss out on when we judge too quickly? Dismiss too soon. I think deeper love requires longer periods of listening, suspending judgment and reflecting being with each other in the ways that God with us came in human form and interacts with us on a closer and deeper personal level. Let me just tell you a little bit more about this film. The teenage girls of Warrenville Prison are not your average delinquents. Having graduated from a juvenile detention to prison, these are the kids most likely to remain in the correctional system for their whole lives. They are also some of the sharpest and more, most ir irrepressible young women you'll meet. When the girls of this prison are given an unlikely shot at redemption, the chance to write and st stage a mat musical based on their lives. To do so, they must relive darkest times, their crimes, and attempt to reclaim their humanity, thus taking the first step toward breaking free of the prisons they are in, the one made of concrete and the one in their minds. Each girl in the cast must come to terms with, their, with her difficult and bitter past as she takes her story to the stage for all to see. Whitney, who is 17, is known as the eyes and ears of Warrenville Prison and becomes the unexpected hero. She is infamous for a crime she won't talk about. Despite this, she soon emerges as one of the most powerful storytellers in the group. Her writing induces and introduces us to her charming, though drug-addicted, father, a man whose mistakes paved the way for his daughter's heinous crimes. As the performance approaches, Whitney's growing voice may lead both of them to confront the past and to try it and heal and move forward. Then there is Rosa, a hot-tempered 16-year-old who taunts and threatens guards and inmates alike. Released from Warrenville, she returns weeks later after almost getting herself killed in a knife fight. With a constant reminder of her temper carved into her throat, she is forced to grapple with the past abuse that is the source of her anger. And lastly, Christina is a friendly, popular girl whose only crime is running away drawn into street life by her mother's drug habit she has spent most of her life in jails and foster placements until she gets a chance to be adopted into a wealthy christian family which she jumps at but struggles to reconcile her new life with her loyalty to her mother's world when the girls finally hit the stage in front of their families and prison staff and utter strangers, hitting the notes isn't important. 
It's their chance to take ownership of their stories and tell them to the world. For some, the musical will be a first step in a back and forth struggle to stay out of the system. Actually, I stole several cars, but only got caught for one. I didn't do nothing. Of course, as everybody says, but um, I cut her from her ear down her neck. I stabbed her in her back. She had to get six stitches. That is not nothing. to tell your stories. That's a risk, isn't it? But it's important that we share the stories of how we've lived. I want to see my scar first. I had a fight with this girl. We got into an argument. And I was beating her up. So she cut me. I don't know. I'm the type of person I always got to fight all the time. Thank you. I got to grow out of that. But they think everything's just supposed to be easy, and they don't know stuff that happens. My mom's a crackhead. My surroundings is basically what I'm worried about right now, because I don't want to go back to the ghetto or whatever. I've lived there my whole life. <laughs> oh, I know. Jim and Margie are the best thing that's happening to me right now. I'm going to go live with them and live the life that I never got to live. But this new world that I'm going to be in, it's going to be so hard, because sometimes I feel out of place when I'm around a lot of white people. I'm real evil, and that's the truth. I um, had an anger problem. All right, I'm, I'm getting frustrated, for real. OK, just do something quick no. so we can I have this thing where you going to give me respect. You going to give me my respect. But when you come across people who disrespect you, I guess I lost it. And now I'm here. Some kids leave here and die. Some kids leave here and be crackheads. Y'all are not everybody like just on this paper leaving in peace and success. All right. I'm a little girl, you know what I'm saying? You no, know I feel to this day my fans don't none of them know. You want me to act, don't I want you to act. One reviewer of this film said that through the remarkable power of telling their stories, these young women had the opportunity to heal. The audience becomes a witness to incredible interchange, which was initiated by the act of storytelling, of opening up and sharing the pain that is buried deep inside and trusting that those listening will take the time to open as well and respond from their hearts and not judge from their minds. And could it just be that the story of Christmas, the story of the birth of Jesus, is precisely about the arrival of something foreign to our expectations and foreign to our familiar way of life. It's a story about being exposed to a whole new set of rules and about learning to see the world with new eyes. And all of the old rules were pretty clear about what happened next. Joseph found out that the young girl to whom he was betrothed was already with child. The ancient world took this very seriously. Legally, you were already considered bound to one another, and there was no easy way to unbind you. Actually, in the Hebrew scriptures, in the book of Deuteronomy, it was declared that death was the appropriate punishment for infidelity, which all assumed was the case for Mary. Years later, it appears that some of the religious requirements surrounding infidelity may have softened. But with that said, softened really isn't the right word for it. This is because the punishment of death had been replaced by a more formal, public renunciation of the woman, 
a ritual that would have shaped her and her family for life. So the old rules were explicit with young girls soon to be married who turn up with child. Now, we don't know much about Joseph. Many suspect that he had died by the time that Jesus began his public ministry. The one thing that we do know is that Jesus was referred to as the carpenter's son, at least on some occasions. So it seems that Joseph's involvement did extend past his time in the gospel stories. At least someone remembered him along the way. Somebody looked at Jesus and saw something of Joseph. But what? You know, it really is hard to say exactly what it would be. Today's reading from Matthew suggests one thing about Joseph's character and personality. When Mary was found to be with child, the gospel says that Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to dissolve their engagement quietly. So he is just and he is righteous. But wait a second. Didn't we just hear that the legal thing, the righteous thing for a man to do was to renounce his fiance in public? A man who was committed to his faith and committed to following the Jewish laws was willing to color inside the lines? Even before the angel of the Lord visits him in a dream, Joseph resolves to bend these expectations and act against the laws of his time and place and station in life. This act of quiet defiance put him at risk of judgment, but it was one that he was willing to take. So he doesn't do what would have been expected of him. He follows the pull of something else. In the beginning, righteousness, and yet even so, unwilling to put Mary to shame, Joseph hears the call to something deeply countercultural. And what is absolutely remarkable about him is that he has the courage and the wisdom to follow that call. Obviously, Joseph didn't know that Christmas was coming. But if you ask me, he heard the call of Advent just the same. He heard it's quiet, insistent longing for a world that follows different rules. A world that seeks to live in the light of great promises and which is no longer trapped by established and often outdated expectations. He heard Advent's invitation to live a life in which, at last, love dares to speak its name. And somehow, in that moment, he knew that love's name is the only one that matters. The story doesn't go on to tell us more about the role that Joseph played in the life of Jesus. We don't know if Joseph even lived long enough to teach jo Joseph mu Jesus much about carpentry, much less anything else. But we know that the love that Jesus talked about, the love that he stood for, was just that kind of daring, rule-changing, deep-seeing kind of love. Just the kind of non-abandoning, instinctive, sheltering, protecting, guiding love. Just that kind, patient, healing love. Love that was strong enough to grasp for something different, undeterred by the conventions and expectations and limitations. Isn't that the way to the future? That is the film Girls on the Wall was all about. Breaking down barriers and defenses and providing an opportunity to come to know and love these young girls and others like them, wanting them to have the love 
that was so eluded them in their young lives. These young girls could have been dismissed. Jesus could have been dismissed if we had judged too quickly. But think of all that we would have missed out on if we had. In all the years that led up to that very first Christmas, we surrounded the season with so many expectations of our own. And this year, more than any other, we are being asked to find a new way of being, of relating and loving, that takes courage and reframing the order of things so the new and better day can be born. For Joseph to hear the call of God's love was the dawn of a distinctly countercultural vision. At its core, the idea of Christmas may seem foreign to everything about us, but we are drawn to it because of the power of our capacity to love and to be loved. So in these next few weeks before Christmas, may you hear the quiet hymn of God's love, God's love song to you and to us all. And may it be the strength you need right now. i
the stillness, let us pray together. God of wisdom and patience, in this season of Advent, we wait for your gifts of hope and love to claim the world once more. We wait on you in prayer, knowing you hear us even before we speak. Prepare our hearts and minds to welcome the coming of your Son once again, and prepare our courage and conviction to follow in your way. Thank you for leading us, especially in these difficult days when pen the pandemic still threatens and people are so divided. We are so grateful that we can rely on your strength and comfort when so much around us has become uncertain. Comfort those who are troubled in mind or spirit as the days grow shorter. Strengthen the bodies and spirits of those who are tired or suffering. Embrace those who are living with loss and protect children and young people from whom the future seems confusing and unimaginable. God, who makes all things new, turn our lives upside down and shake out the unnecessary distractions of this season. Focus us on what is truly important and who, who truly matters to us. Turn our lives upside right so that our priorities and purpose match those we have learned from Jesus. Shape and reshape us until we conform to his way of living and his likeness. Turn us upside down, O oh God, so that we value what is hidden and small more than what is showy and grand. Open our eyes to the needs of the most vulnerable in our community and help us speak out with them and for them even if we must challenge those who usually get their way. Turn us right side up, O oh God, so that we can see what we have more than enough resources to share with those who have much less than they need day by day. Hear us now as we take a moment too to share the names who weigh heaviest on our hearts this day, both in, this, in a moment of silence and aloud praying for those on our prayer list. As we pray for Bob and Marilyn, for Paul and Mo, for Myrna, for John, for Lee, and for Joyce. God, strengthen us with your spirit here and now, now and always. And hear us now as we pray together using the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. There are five ways to give to the ministry and work at Heritage United Church. You can mail a check or checks to the church. You can decide to give via pre-authorized remittance or park. You can donate online via our website. Go to heritageunited.ca forward slash give. You can give using your offertory envelopes and drop them off at Carol D's house. Or you may wish to give via e-transfer. We thank you, God, for all the love you have given to us. In gratitude and to support your ministry, we now offer you what we have to give.
closing hymn, or as we are calling them for the season of Advent, our Carol of Resistance, was written in 1849 by a Massachusetts Unitarian minister, Reverend Edmund Hamilton Sears. One verse has been left out of several hymnals over the decades since then, but the United Church's Voices United restored this powerful verse with a slight change to the wording that refers to the love song of the angels being drowned out by our warring nature. Yet with the woes of sin and strife, the world has suffered long. Beneath the angel strain hath rolled two thousand years of wrong. And warring the humankind hears not the love song which they bring. Oh, hush the noise and cease the strife and hear the angels sing. Let us be reminded that we are to listen to the angel chorus and then to join it, raising our voices with the message that love not hate is the answer. Let us joyously sing together our hymn today, It Came Upon a Midnight Clear. Let us sing. out the news that God is with us, Emmanuel, and continues to fill the night left by sadness with messages of love. Go into your lives humming the tunes that keep that love alive in you and that spur you on in your work of justice and reconciliation. Raise your voices and repeat with me. 
Do not be afraid. Amen and Amen.